tonight. Uh, welcome to everybody to tonight's uh, Sir Michael Howard Center uh, event. This is the first event in our new series on conflict records, and uh, it's an appropriate evening to launch um, the first in what will be a series of events related to conflict records, and also to, uh, at this stage, informally launch our conflict records unit. Um, I'm Professor Joe Maiolo, director of the uh, Sir Michael Howard Center for the Study of War, and I'm going to be introducing in a moment um, Dr. Michael Innes, who's going to be, who is now the new director of the Conflict Records Unit, and he'll be introducing tonight's speaker. The one thing I just wanted to emphasize is that um, this is the uh, uh, one-year anniversary since uh, we held in the College Chapel Sir Michael Howard's uh, a memorial service for Sir Michael Howard, and I want to also underscore just how appropriate it is that we're launching the Conflict Records Unit this evening. I think it's gonna be a, an enormous tribute to Sir Michael Howard's work as a historian and continue um, his appreciation for um, the study of war and modern war in all of its dimensions. And particularly with an emphasis on, of course, the historical study of war and the importance of archives, records uh, and empirical materials. So. Uh, with that, let me just turn everything over to um, uh, Michael Innes. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> I'm Mike Innes. I'm director of the Conflict Records Unit, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Joe has just introduced us. Uh, Dr. William Wiley is our guest. Bill is the executive founder and executive director of the Commission for International Justice and Accountability. Um, I suppose before I start introducing that, I should say a word or two about the unit uh, and about the speaker series. Uh, the unit's new. It's something that we've you know, set up in the last few months, um, and we have uh, some pretty serious ambitions for what we want to achieve with it. Um, the basic remit is, is to develop and host conflict records, uh, to make use of them for research, and also to take a look at the phenomenon, re research the, the legal and moral and ethical and, and best practice. Uh, in terms of research using conflict records. For those of you who are not uh, au fait with the, uh, with the terminology, uh, conflict records is a, bit, a little bit of an intellectual fad, um, but, but with a, a deep history. Um, in its narrowest sense, it's about captured enemy records. Uh, in its broadest sense, um, it is uh, you know, primary sources, as historians would understand them, generated by parties to a conflict. Um, and, we, and we, I think, uh, differentiate the conflict records unit in that we're uh, looking at the entire spectrum. We're quite interested in as historians and primary sources, of course, but in as students and scholars of war in all its forms, uh, we're, we're quite interested in making sure we sort of cover the spectrum and understand how this works in, in different ways in different time periods and in different conflicts. And our focus tonight is something very contemporary, um, and that is um, what uh, Bill, Bill and I will be talking about. Uh, it'll be more of a conversation rather than Bill giving a talk and then a Q&A period. So it'll be an informal back and forth, I think, between uh, Bill and I. Um, I should mention that this is the first event that we are holding. We have a speaker series that will be kicking off in September of uh, this year. And we'll be holding a monthly speaker series. Our first will be Thomas Heghammer, who is uh, one of the world's leading scholars on, on uh, jihadi movements. And he'll be talking about the jihadi document repository that uh, has been set up at the University of Oslo. And then we have a monthly uh, speaker thereafter through to the spring of 2022, uh, covering, covering quite a few different um, types of record sets and archives and documentation projects and conflicts. And I think uh, we'll be posting a link to that event series so that people are aware and uh, can see for themselves. And there it is. Okay, um, I think I've covered the basics. Uh, with that, I want to um, do a brief introduction of Bill, but I don't wanna speak for him. Um, Bill, Bill's been profiled in, in press extensively uh, over the last, I suppose, going on a decade. Uh, in relation to his work uh, with, with CJA, CJA being the Commission for International Justice and Accountability. You'll hear us saying CJA quite often. It's just the, the abbreviation of the acronym CIJA. Uh, Bill has a PhD in international law and has been working as a criminal investigator and a lawyer, if, I'm, if I've got that accurately, um, uh, on um, 
in quite a few different sort of conflict settings and institutional settings uh, prior to setting up CJA. Um, and I suppose, you know, given, given, all the, Bill, given all the public information that's out there about you, you, you've been profiled in famously in the New Yorker and the New York Times and all the major press. Um, uh, I, I suppose the way to start would be to ask you to tell us a little bit about the commission. Tell us a little bit about CJA. You're on mute, Bill. At least I'm not a cat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much to, to the unit and, and the center for having me. Um, it's a real, uh, it's actually, it, it's a pleasure. I've known uh, since I was young about um, the uh, War Studies Program. In fact, uh, when I finished my first degree and, and wanted to study overseas, I, I applied to the War Studies Program. I applied to Oxford. Um, I was accepted to both, improbably, and uh, in the end, I went to Oxford. And uh, within a couple of days, I met Sir Michael, and uh, he there was, uh, I'm, I'm really more of a historian than, than, than a law guy, or at least I was, and uh, I'll come back to that. And there was a cocktail party or something for the new history grad students. And uh, I was then, and, and frankly now, I'm not too good at cocktail parties where I don't know anyone. And, uh, but I certainly knew who Sir Michael was from, from my undergraduate readings. I was very fond of military history. And he uh, approached me and said, hi, I'm Michael Howard. I'm pleased to meet you. And of course, I couldn't talk. Uh, I was completely uh, intimidated by what you would know better than me was a, a wonderful uh, man. And uh, I hadn't realized it was the anniversary of his memorial service uh, about now. And uh, at any rate, he, he was, I don't know if he was my moral tutor or, or something like that, but um, uh, I was summoned to see him periodically and I would sit in his office and um, he was quite a bit shorter than me, but he seemed a, a tall and always in my mind's eye. And uh, I still couldn't talk. I don't think I ever uttered a sensible word uh, to Sir Michael um, in all my interactions with him. Uh, but hopefully, uh, uh, now speaking at his center and, and with the conflict records, you know, I'll do better tonight. Um, just to add to my background, I I'm, I'm really was trained as a historian rather than a lawyer. I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I, I do have a law degree, but I don't, uh, I don't have a practicing certificate. Um, I came up through the system of international criminal law, international crimes. Um, through the intelligence analyst and, and uh, investigative streams. And I have occasionally worked as a legal advisor internationally, but uh, the focus today will be much more um, on, on uh, well, wherever you want to take it, Mike, but it'll be much more on, on the nuances of, of case building and investigations rather than uh, prosecutions. And indeed, in part, because we don't have that many perpetrators uh, yet um, from the uh, wars in Syria and Iraq uh, who've been prosecuted. Um, now, what is the CJA, to, 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 with that long-winded introduction, to, to go back to your question? Um, CJA is uh, the first, and um, for the time being still only, but I do hope that will change, private uh, international criminal investigative body. It was, um, it came out of um, the initial engagement in Syria of in 2011 and 12 of a company that uh, I owned and, uh, and another company that was owned by um, a colleague from the Yugoslavia Tribunal uh, from, from the old days. And um, my colleague was asked by the Foreign Office uh, in 2011 to do some human rights stuff in, in Syria. And um, I, my colleague rang me because uh, his skill set was a bit different than mine and said, do you want to do some human rights stuff in Syria? And I said, no, I'm a criminal investigator. I'm, I'm not a human rights guy. Um, but if the Foreign Office wants something done, then um, 
we'll do is we'll sensitize, we'll sensitize and try to harness the tremendous energy of the civil society of, of, uh, and individuals um, on the opposition uh, side of the confrontation lines at that time. We'll try to harness that energy um, in a way to uh, uh, collect um, prima facie evidence with an eye to the future prosecution of, at that time we were focused solely on, on the Syrian regime. And the foreign office, the answer came back from the foreign office, uh, God bless them, they're still a donor to this day. Um, yeah, that's fine, just get out there and do something. And off we went. And, uh, and after a few months of dealing with these individuals in Syria, uh, the idea presented itself, uh, at least to my mind, that we could create a private criminal investigative body that would act as a bridge between, if you will, the offenses being perpetrated at that time and the public sector, whether it be domestic or national war crimes units and uh, the international community um, coming up with its own criminal investigative and prosecutorial structure, uh, such as had been in the Yugoslavia Tribunal, Rwanda Tribunal and, and, and the rest. So the idea was effectively that we would build cases, collect prima facie evidence, build cases, and um, uh, such that when, because the regime was losing the war for about 2012, when an international court or tribunal was established, the office of the prosecutor of that body would hit the ground running. And that is still the CJA uh, objective. It's the model we, uh, Fly in Syria still these be the Syrian regime um, since 2014 in, in Syria and Iraq these be uh, Daesh or Islamic State and and in our other operational theaters it's, it's effectively um, extending the reach of the public sector into high risk environments where they would have uh, limited or no freedom of, of movement with an eye to um, criminal investigative work such that um, the public sector can ultimately take over from us uh, and, and see that uh, perpetrators of, of core national crimes are ultimately prosecuted. Always happens. I'm interested in the, uh, the impetus for the creation of CJ. You, you described a set of circumstances where you happen to be more or less in the right place at the right time. Um, but, you know, the, I think the bigger story involves some of your previous experience working for various courts. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. I, I suppose it's a little bit deeper background, but uh, of interest, I think. Yeah, the, um, the formative experience uh, with respect to um, putting the seeds in my mind for what, what ultimately became CJA was my time at the International Criminal Court from uh, 2003 to 2005. I, I was the first investigator uh, retained by the court um, when, it, when it was operationalized in 2003. I, I, I came over from the ICTY, the Yugoslavia Tribunal. And here was the first time that uh, I had worked and indeed any international court or tribunal had operated these uh, the um, the offenses or, or, or the perpetrators uh, the suspects in if you will real time and uh, everything else was a, a one way or another in my career and, and the other courts in which I, I didn't work was a post-conflict response so Yugoslavia tribunal, Rwanda Tribunal, Special Court for Sierra Leone, uh, the Cambodia uh, Extraordinary Chambers of the Courts of Cambodia was established decades after, after the mass murder uh, of, of Pol Pot and his crew in, in Cambodia and so forth. And what we found with the ICC operations, I, I was, uh, the first case we did and what I worked on for my two years was in the Eastern uh, Congo, uh, Eastern DRC. Um, what, what we found is that uh, the security situation was such that even though um, the handful of colleagues 
that I had at that part of myself. We had quite a bit of freedom of movement there um, because the court was so, so new, it hadn't put a lot of security restrictions on us. That came a bit later after I left. But there was still risks uh, that, that complicated the, the, the process of gathering uh, prima facie evidence. So, um, so we got around a fair bit ourselves. but what we effectively uh, tried to do in a quite an informal way, uh, we're spending most of our time in, in the Eastern Congo uh, as, as investigators, was trying to harness the local um, uh, NGO capacity um, to, to get into areas that, that we, uh, particularly as Westerners, couldn't discreetly uh, access. And um, um, we could, from our, our base in the East, we could run sensitive sources and that kind of thing, but, but physical access, even, even where, where the risk was, was acceptable, um, what was a problem because even in that case, we roll in with, you know, Bangladeshi, uh, BMP 80s and all this stuff. It was, or fly in is, is completely indiscreet. So the question, so I went off to Iraq from there to work a, as a legal advisor in, in the Iraqi high tribunal. But, um, whilst I was still in Iraq, um, I wrote a, a, a book chapter, actually the former colleague from the ICC, setting out uh, in theoretical terms what became the ICC model, or the CIJ model, the CJ model. Um, now it's much more involved than, than, than that book chapter envisioned as, it, as it's turned out, but the idea is that the, the public institution uh, harnesses in some way domestic capacity on mass. Um, such that the disadvantages of being uh, foreign uh, to an operational theater, um, particularly the, the security disadvantages, would be, uh, uh, as we found in practice, largely overcome. So, um, and what I argued in that chapter with, with my colleague, my erstwhile colleague, was that I, I, I made a, uh, we made a, a very minor case that, that ultimately the future of international criminal investigations and prosecutions, where they are, were undertaken in, if you will, real time, um, would ideally rest on, on, on public uh, private partnerships. And the public component is understood as, as international and domestic law enforcement. Uh, the private, uh, we didn't envision a, a commercial model, although frankly, I don't, there, Siege is a nonprofit, but there's nothing wrong with that, to my mind. Um, but we envision effectively harnessing um, civil societal capability. And, um, and it's, it's worked marvelously well. It's, it's much faster because of the freedom of movement um, and because it's it's a private organization, it's, it's much more flexible in its hiring uh, policies um, and where people aren't needed anymore because of change of operational focus uh, in whole or in part. Um, they, they, if we don't have jobs for them, they, they can be let go readily. And, um, and of course the salary and benefit packages are do not approach those of, of international public service, not even close. I think some, some of those points we're gonna be coming back to later later in the chat, uh, especially this, the CJ model. Um, could, could you walk us through some of the, in broad strokes at least, you know, and, and what you can say, some of the mechanics about how CJ works in the field, in the office um, and beyond? Yeah, the, 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 the structure of CJ is very similar to an office of the prosecutor in any of the international courts and tribunals. It's, it's more or less consciously uh, mimics those structures because the mission is, is effectively the same. The, the, the one difference is um, uh, we don't uh, obviously have a prosecution division. We, we employ law, lawyers. Uh, international lawyers, because we do prepare uh, prosecution case briefs. 
to hand off to, to our partners. Um, so there is legal analytical work done, but the bulk of the resources go into collection. So the vast majority of CG personnel are deployed. Um, if you take our uh, Syria operations at, at their peak, um, let's say the Syrian regime crimes team probably had about 70 personnel. Um, 40 of those, or actually 45 or even 50 of those would have been deployed in Syria. Um, then atop that, you, you would have another um, six or eight headquarters analysts, then a sprinkling of lawyers, some operational support people in, in uh, neighboring states, states neighboring Turkey, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Syria. And, and so forth. So pretty soon you get a big team to get operating vis-a-vis -vis only one uh, institutional target, that being the Syrian regime. Uh, the Dash team at its peak was probably about 50 uh, personnel. Uh, in fact, it's still about 50 personnel. In fact. So um, again, the vast majority of deployed in, in Syria and then uh, also in Iraq. The um, uh, so the key thing first is uh, collection of prima facie evidence. Um, what we're looking for uh, first and foremost is uh, documentation, paper documentation generated by the perpetrating structures. So whether it's uh, Daesh or the Syrian regime, um, just to take those two examples, but it's, it's the same in any other conflict or any other institutional target. Um, we're uh, looking for political materials, military materials, and security intelligence materials. So we don't have any interest in the cadaster or the driver's uh, license uh, registration bureau and all, all this sort of stuff. So where the Syrian regime's concerned, um, we've extracted from Syria about 1.1 million pages of uh, paper, pieces of paper. It's, uh, must be now about five tons of, uh, of metric tons of paper. Um, that's all been brought back into Europe and, and digitalized. Uh, there is the paper archive. The analysts, for the most part, work from the digital um, um, print or version, but they do have access to the archive as they need it, the paper archive. Um, so that's really the key because historically, uh, since Nuremberg, any, um, any big quality international criminal prosecution is going to be based on paper generated by um, the perpetrating structures, the security intelligence structures, the military structures. Um, where that kind of paper is absent, you're going to be uh, heavily dependent on witness testimony and all the problems that, that uh, go with witness testimony. Whether it's uh, what we call crime-based witnesses, uh, colloquially perhaps known as victim witnesses, um, people who are victimized or um, witness the vic eye eyewitnesses to the victimization of others. Um, as, as any other witness, they're mistaken in fact uh, frequently uh, oftentimes in uh, desire to help the prosecution at the investigative stage, um, they may provide uh, helpful uh, inf information they believe is helpful, but in fact is not uh, true uh, uh, or it's hearsay, um, but it's not presented as such as hearsay. Um, and uh, the key witnesses in building an international criminal case are, are what we call linkage witnesses or, or typically uh, perhaps known by you as insider witnesses. These are uh, men, almost always men, who served within the perpetrating structures. Um, and of course, they're always problematical. They're, they're gonna be keen to avoid prosecution themselves and have uh, all manner of reasons to, um, not so much to embellish the truth, but to deflect attention from themselves onto others by, by truthful or, or very often untruthful means. So, um, so the key is, as I said, to gather documentation generated by the, the perpetrating structures um, because it, it tends to be honest. And it's those volumes of massive volumes of paper that we're looking for, any international investigative body is looking for, uh, 
that make them, those institutions very heavily dependent if they're properly structured on analysts. Many of whom I might add uh, have training, uh, are trained as historians, or at least have studied history. Um, so, um, and I'll just add, where Dash is concerned, um, it generated a lot of paper. Um, we haven't got our hands on all of it as yet uh, from, from the battlefield, but there is a lot that's in the right hands. Um, and that, but that process is ongoing with an eye to, to effective law enforcement measures, particularly in the West. Um, but Dash um, generated a lot of uh, computer files. So um, it was very bureaucratic in its structures. It did aspire to be a state. Uh, as, as the name suggests, Islamic State. Um, uh, it, its leadership was heavily Iraq-based uh, or, or largely Iraqi um, um, for most of its life at its peak. Um, Iraq is a very, very bureaucratic state, so it, it, it reflected that aspect of Iraqi um, political culture. Um, but the Dash adherents tended to be very young, and uh, certainly the uh, Westerners and many of the Middle Eastern boys that found their way to Dash tended to be computer literate. So what we found with Dash is a tremendous amount of um, um, document, uh, physical evidence, documentation, if you will, but it was only ever in electronic form. So this is something separate and apart from, say, videos, uh, photographs. I mean, obviously, we, we collect all that stuff, but um, nominal roles, uh, payrolls, uh, um, uh, you know, each piece relatively anodyne, but when put together, uh, orders of battle, once it's all put together, it gives you very, very, it gives the analyst very, very good uh, understandings of, of the structures of the C3 arrangements, the command control communications arrangements within those structures. And, um, and indeed, the rank and file uh, of those structures. Um, so the key then is, is the, the pointy end, the, the collection capability. As it already intimated, it feeds into um, uh, the analytical um, component because 85% of um, the international criminal case building process is um, uh, effectively involves the reconstruction of those perpetrating structures. Um, very, a surprisingly small amount of, 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 the, of the resources in building these cases, 10, 15%, depending on the case, goes into looking at crimes. You know, who got killed, where, how, uh, and that sort of thing. That's actually a very small and, and conceptually quite, uh, conceptually in terms of execution, quite a simple um, component of the case building process. The key is building um, the linkage case, um, the, 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 the links in the chain between the physical uh, perpetration of the criminal acts, the murders, the sexual offenses, and so forth, um, going up the chain of command, so hence the need to understand the structure to the top guys, the guys in charge of those perpetrating structures, because ultimately international criminal prosecutions, um, if all is going according to plan and there's proper leadership of the institutions, are targeting those res most responsible for the crimes. They shouldn't be looking at, at, at low level rank and file guys. Um, um, the, the, it's, it's not a good use of resources in, 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 in the international context. You mentioned paper and you elaborated and talked about, you know, uh, information evidence that's, that's born digital. I guess the, the obvious question for, for this researcher community is, is, is where's it coming from? How is it accessed? How is it sourced to the extent that you can actually, you know, discuss that in, in a forum like this? Like, I guess that, that's the a more nuts and bolts kind of question that I'm sure everybody's sort of interested in hearing a little bit about. Um, well, to give some real world examples, um, with um, 
with, with the Syrian regime and Daesh, effectively it's sourced in, it has been sourced in, in, in two, two ways. Um, Sija in, in Syria um, and indeed in Iraq um, made uh, de facto, established de facto partnerships with armed groups. Um, that's our modus operandi everywhere. Um, and Siege is not a human rights body, it's a criminal investigative body. So uh, operating in very high risk environments. So we can't investigate everybody. It's, 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 it's simply not possible because uh, we have no friends. Uh, we, need, we need friends. We, we can't move, we, we wouldn't get any evidence. Um, um, and uh, we have been criticized for that. And, 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 and from a moral perspective, I do understand the criticism but my retort has been that um, the, the, the CGI model is there and others can replicate it. It's not copyrighted and uh, investigate groups that, you know, we work with or, or CGI is not for whatever reason investigating. Now there's a, there's a limit. There's always been a limit to who we'll work with. So um, when this front, uh, emerged in 2013 in uh, Syria. That was the official uh, Al-Qaeda syndicate or, or branch in Syria. Um, when it emerged, it was extremely radical and, and, and quite a serious threat to, to, to our people because of our Western uh, influence. Uh, you know, the siege is a Western-led uh, institution, although the majority of our personnel um, are Syrian, Iraqi, and so forth. And uh, so we stayed quite clear of Nusra Front, but when uh, what became Daesh or Islamic State broke away from Nusra in 2014, Nusra was, uh, was very much a, a Syrian uh, organization. It was uh, still um, quite uh, conservative, but the, the, the rough radical jihadi uh, elements of, of Nusra, if I can put it that way, had gone with uh, Daesh. And there was uh, franchises, if you will, of Nusra because it had no centralized uh, command and control element um, that we could have worked with. Um, they weren't terribly criminal. The only reason we didn't work with them is, is uh, because they remained a designated terrorist organization. But from a, if you will, a moral or ethical point of view, um, it, it, it's something that, that, that we would have looked at if they weren't a terrorist organization. Now, there's been other groups in Syria that <clears throat> are not terribly ideological on the opposition side. Um, they're not obviously not designated terrorist organizations, but <clears throat> we stayed clear of because their human rights record was not uh, ideal. Um, but we had a great uh, many uh, operational partners in the early days. The, the military configuration has changed immensely uh, over the years. But we had a great many partners in the early days. And effectively, when the regime was on the defensive, effectively from late 2012 until the Russian intervention in September 2015, in particular with its Russian air power, which put the opposition on the defensive, uh, and that's where it remains to this day, our de facto partners, those that we worked with, were overrunning large swathes of, of Syrian regime territory. And the regime was leaving behind um, uh, documents. It's, it's actually uh, quite difficult to um, uh, burn paper uh, in a barrel or something. It's, it's, if anyone's trying to do it, as I did when, when our program in Iraq was shutting down, um, it's actually really hard to, to burn huge amounts of paper in a, in a burn barrel, for example, or a barbecue or something. It's incredibly time consuming. Um, so the regime often, uh, personnel often fled at uh, short notice and that would leave, uh, say, brigade headquarters, battalion headquarters. I mean, battalion headquarters wouldn't have much of an archive, but brigade headquarters would, not a forward headquarters, but a proper standing headquarters. Um, and particularly security intelligence uh, facilities. So the uh, vast, I wouldn't say the vast majority, but if I had to guess, I'd say 70% uh, 
of the 1.1 million pages of material we, we hold, possibly more, is security intelligence material taken from static uh, facilities where uh, the, the personnel uh, who occupied it normally had fled at, at, at fairly short notice. So the principal issue was not, uh, aside from sensitizing the groups that, that we were there and wanted to get our hands on, our st on this stuff, the principal uh, issue at the beginning um, when uh, the Free Syrian Army units, which was our they were our principal partners at the start, were so badly armed uh, and, and, and very brave, but in military terms, extremely uh, amateurish um, in terms of their tactics and so forth. Um, and, and to a degree, I think, discipline. Um, they would get into these places and they were looking for weapons and ammunition because they needed it. Um, but then they were setting them a light and dancing around and, and, and putting videos on YouTube it was driving us crazy. And, and we finally got them around to the position fairly quickly that, look, get, you know, take what you want, um, um, give us a chance to get the documents out first, or, or you do it. Uh, oftentimes they do it for us um, as, as the SOP took hold and, uh, across a uh, huge part of the opposition. Um, then if you want to put the place on fire and dance around and put it on YouTube, then go ahead. And uh, so the key to uh, acquiring electronic devices and, uh, and paper documentation has always been our partnerships with our groups in Syria and, and indeed elsewhere. Um, and to a degree, um, we've never done it with the Syrian regime. Uh, we, we've had a, a one case in particular where a defector came out um, from Damascus, from a very high level uh, committee chaired by President Assad, um, with uh, quite a volume of minutes of meetings of that committee. But, uh, um, and then of course there's the Caesar files that, that everyone's uh, aware of, the, the pictures of thousands and thousands of, of principally men who, who perished in, in uh, security intelligence detention facilities. That was not a siege operation, I hasten to add. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but it's too dangerous, it was too dangerous to run sensitive sources in the Syrian regime. We were quite successful at doing it where we chose to do it within Daesh structures because Daesh had a great many adherents at its peak uh, who were really there for opportunistic reasons or reasons of self-preservation. So um, as dangerous as Daesh was, it was, much less difficult than you might envision to penetrate those structures securely or, or relatively securely and uh, and acquire uh, information in that way. So it's basically those two ways are how we get the, the key forms, the key evidence. This, this is a question I was going to bring up later, but, but it strikes me that this is a good time to, to ask it now, partly because there's a there was a, a story that was just published, I think it was in the New Republic, about the, the trauma that historians undergo um, uh, in, in sort of, you know, documenting and, and writing accounts of things like genocide and, and, uh, and, and other, you know, sort of horrific historical events. And I, I guess this is a, a, bit of a, a bit of a tangent to the mechanics that we're talking about, but, you know, the, on the field side, I mean, this is, this is dangerous work. You know, CJ, if I'm, you know, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but CJ has lost people. You're operating in the middle of a war zone. That's traumatic enough. But then you've also got people looking at the evidence of this, documented evidence of this, you know, in a, in a far away remote place, physically safe, but, but they're having to digest all this. So, I mean, you know, is that something that you can comment on? I mean, I just want to, kind of the, the moral, the, the morale impact, I suppose. Um, what kinds of trauma that you know your people have to you have to deal with um, uh, you know the kind of risks you have to deal with physically and, and, and psychically uh, I suppose I, I, I think to look at CJ or any office of the prosecutor um, internationally um, or the domestic police force the, the um, um, it's, it's it's analogous to what I remember from from uh, my, my military days is the, now, of course, there's, there's professional support available and, and, and so forth in, in 
all the institutions. But um, ultimately, uh, at least from what I can see from Siege, is ultimately peer support. So initially, there's people who get into this field, the men and women who get into this field and stay with it. They're, they, it attracts, if you will, a certain type. I'm not saying everyone's the same. Um, but um, it attracts uh, adventures. People are interested in an unusual work. Um, um, it, 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 there's somehow a self-selective element to the building of, of these institutions on, on an individual basis. Um, and then ultimately the peer support. Um, and that, 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 it sounds like a cliche, but that becomes a leadership issue. So Siege is quite big. Uh, I don't, for years now, we've been around 150 personnel. We might be a touch less now, 140 or something. Um, so I, you know, and people are spread around the world. So I don't, I don't even know anyone who works for Siege. I haven't met it, but, uh, to be honest. Um, to send the message down um, that uh, sometimes overtly um, that it's the responsibility of subordinate leaders and managers to the institutions to keep an eye on the people, um, to make sure they're getting some lead. Um, are people deployed uh, in Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere um, to uh, Especially the, the men and women who've been in Syria to to uh, get them out of Syria from time to time. Um, Iraq, we, we generally don't bring our people out of Iraq, but uh, I think as as certainly you'll know, Mike and and many of the people uh, watching today will know, um, there are sectors in Iraq that are, um, especially in northern Iraq, that that are considerably safer than parts of London. I mean, it's. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, maybe not as much to do, but um, if they want a beer or, or just hang out in a peaceful place, that's that's eminently doable. So um, in the headquarters, making sure our, our personnel are getting, are taking enough leave. Um, uh, we often find with some of our people in the field, including the internationals that we have deployed, um, that uh, you know, there'll be, um, I don't know quite how to put it, but uh, they'll be a bit cranky, yeah? And, and they'll, they'll lash out. And, and typically they're, they're not entirely men, but they're mostly men, uh, maybe not quite my age, but in their 40s or 50s, generally ex-military, or you know, they have a background in security services or both um, in, in, in their home country. And uh, these are individuals with a lot of self-discipline. So as soon as we see that crankiness, um, it's not, the instinct is not to punish the individual for, for the insubordinate, if I can put it that way. The, the first instinct is, uh, it looks like they need a rest. And uh, we'll send them home or, or get them somewhere else for a while. And then, and then typically they're fine. So I, I, I I, I suppose one should say that, yeah, we, we have two staff psychologists and stuff like that. But to be quite honest, the, the psychologist, someone going to a psychologist is, is good if they need to go, but that's where things have gone a bit too far, if, if you will. The peer support hasn't been sufficient. Um, the leadership has been insufficient. Uh, I'm not saying in every case where someone, someone needs professional help, but um, if, if it's repeatedly the case then, then clearly there's a fail, institutional failure. So ultimately mine in the case of Sweden. I've got a bunch more questions uh, about the mechanics, about the implications of your work, about the the the, the larger sort of ecosystem of, of I guess knowledge workers and investigators of various kinds historically and, and contemporaneously. But uh, we've got a suggestion uh, given the time, we've almost been going for an hour now, that we should probably move to Q&A and take some questions. And I, I think anything that uh, that I wanted to ask, uh, if it comes up in the questions in the afternoon, if it doesn't, I can I can uh, interject periodically. But uh, but if that's okay with you, we can um, uh, open things up to Q&A.
Um, the way we'll work is any, any of the audience who want to ask questions, please drop your questions into the chat function. And, uh, and uh, I have instructions to weave my questions into, I will. Um, but yeah, what we'll do is uh, anybody who's, in the, uh, who's, who's attending, who's listening in, who's watching, uh, please drop the questions into the chat function and we'll, uh, we'll field them from there. I'm not seeing anything so far. I'm assuming it's open to everybody. It's in the uh, Q and A box. I'm looking at. There we go. Okay, thank you. Um, can you see them as well, Bill? I'm, I'm looking at them now. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to? Do you want to just start working through them, or? You're you're the boss, Mike. <laughs> okay. Uh, first one from. I'm just going to go in the order that I'm seeing them. Uh, from Juliet. Could you ask when you think it's appropriate to see participate in the Koblenz trial? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, as we're speaking, there are headlines right now about a, uh, a trial in Germany, a landmark, uh, a conviction, I think, um, that, uh, that was based in part uh, on evidence that CJA uh, contributed. And I think the, the question is if CJA participated and um, was CJA involved to help? Yeah. Just a general question. Yeah, thanks, uh, Juliet, if I may. That uh, certainly is a timely question. Um, for those who don't know, the um, uh, there's been a trial ongoing for uh, about a year now, uh, maybe a bit last, in Koblenz, Germany, pursuing the universal jurisdiction. Um, it, it's uh, there's two men on trial. Well, one of them was convicted today. Um, I had a his surname is Al Ghari. Um, he was a sergeant in Syrian uh, state security uh, from, uh, he was a career man. Uh, he defected in 2013, I believe, ultimately found his way to Germany. Um, he was convicted today of uh, aiding and abetting crimes against humanity. He was involved in arrest squads, arresting protesters and others on, on Syrian regime arrest lists, and delivering them to a key Radio branch uh, known as 251 in central Damascus, where um, the gang were uh, subjected to all manner of offensive murder, torture, um, uh, rape, and, and, and so forth. Um, his co accused is named Anwar Ruslan. Ruslan is uh, by far the bigger and more interesting target. Uh, Ruslan was a uh, full colonel in Syrian state security. Uh, he was head of, again, a career man. He was head of interrogation in 2011, of branch 251. So that means he's responsible for all interrogations in what was a massive security branch. Uh, and everything that goes with those interrogations, which we most of you be familiar with. And um, then he went to uh, a specialized branch, also in central Damascus, 285, as head of interrogation, and ultimately he defected in late 2012. Uh, his trial will be ongoing, but he will be convicted of much more serious offenses, uh, assuredly, later this year. Um, Siege's role in this trial, um, and I don't want to take anything away from our colleagues. Um, in the federal police and federal prosecutor's office in, in Germany, because they've done a magnificent job and it's uh, their show and it's, it's their victory. But I'd like to think of victory for the Syrian people and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, CJA provided quite a bit of contextual evidence on the structure. And again, I come back to the issue of structure. Uh, the structure and leadership of, of branches 251 and 285, where uh, the accused, uh, the two accused fit into those structures um, and um, in, where the case of uh, Raslan, Colonel Raslan is concerned, we had, a, uh, we had and indeed have a number of documents uh, we found in our archive with his uh, signature on them, um, uh, his signature on attack on interrogation protocols. So, um, Basically, what CJ was able to do for our colleagues in Germany and for the court was map out the criminal context, uh, put uh, the two accused, particularly the Ross Lauren, um, 
Roslan, qua Roslan, uh, into that context at a particular uh, temp temporal period. Um, and then what uh, the, the Germans did on their own, with, I, I, and I want to know with the, with the assistance of, of some other NGOs, um, particularly uh, ECCHR in, in Berlin, uh, they took care of what we call the crime base. So there's been a great many uh, witnesses who were incarcerated in branches 251 and 285 who could speak to uh, the treatment that they received, which was, as you can imagine, exceedingly unpleasant. But what those witnesses couldn't speak to was um, the, um, uh, the structure and, uh, of those uh, institutions. None of them had ever seen Raslan or Al Ghuri. Um, and uh, finally, um, one of my uh, colleagues, the senior director of the investigations and operations, he testified at the trial over two days. Uh, uh, they, they didn't don't use precisely the same terminology in Germany, but he effectively testified as an expert witness uh, to the structures um, of uh, Syrian state security, of those two security intelligence branches, and. Um, uh, to the role of, of, of the accused, particularly Russell. So we're, we're really happy for, frankly, for the Syrian people to see this uh, initial conviction because it's the first time in history uh, anywhere in the world where a Syrian government security intelligence official has been held to account for uh, current national crimes. And even though uh, Al Reeves something with nobody as opposed to Ross Lawn. That's a that's a really big uh, that's a really big thing for the Syrian people. We've got two questions that I think uh, the two next questions, I think they, they relate to the uh, the CJA model. And I was gonna I was going to ask you earlier to you know go into a bit more depth on, on what's involved with that. I I think this is related to that. One is from Joanna and that's do you take the deposition of witnesses in the field, victims, humanitarian workers, etc. And the second one from Rachel is um, how does CJ ensure chain of custody is preserved when encountering voluminous documentary evidence in the middle of a war zone? Asking as the authenticity of documents and chain of command issues could be raised in international criminal proceedings. So those are the two questions. First, yeah, one. Our, our, our principal uh, is, is uh, thank you, Joanna, and thank you, uh, Rachel. Uh, our principal. Um, focus again is on documentary evidence in paper electronic form. Um, we do interview a lot of witnesses between Syria and Iraq. I believe we've interviewed uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 4,000 witnesses. I don't, maybe a touch less, but it's, it's quite substantial. Um, we don't take depositions in the, in the formal sense, to, to use your term, Joanna. Um, we, what we do is prepare interview reports um, they're prepared in the third person, so it's not um, in the form of a deposition or, or a, a formal witness statement. Um, the witness doesn't sign it. Um, the reason it's done in the third person is um, because ultimately we're collecting uh, on behalf of uh, public law enforcement and, and prosecutorial authorities. So. Um, if on the basis of what we don't want is a, um, uh, contradictions between our information only by police or prosecutors. And one of the ways it's a, it's a legal trick, uh, in a certain way, uh, by Preparing our witness interview reports in the third person, where there is a dis, uh, an important um, uh, what is taken in the formal process by public officials, that discrepancy can be blamed on 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 CJA, uh, that it it um, our investigator or investigators misunderstood the witness or didn't record things, because it's important because 
it's, it's a principle of criminal investigations. The more times you interview a witness, uh, and it could be the best witness in the world, and the more times that witness testimony uh, rather testifies, you are going to have discrepancies uh, um, one form or another, which will be exploited by the defense counsel and should be exploited by the defense counsel. I say this as someone who's done a fair bit of defense work. Um, um, because that's what makes the process fair. Um, the um, second question from Rachel uh, concerned chain of custody. For those who don't know, chain of custody is a, a process where, where physical evidence, uh, the, the, the movement of physical evidence from point A to B to C to D um, is, is recorded on a form. This is a, a technical uh, process. Um, it's uh, important, um, but I think I watch very little TV, but I, I, as I get asked about this a lot, um, I, I, I'm starting to suspect that cop films and CSI stuff maybe make a big thing of this. Um, CSI effect. Yeah. Yeah, but, okay. um, we're both 25 years behind in the TV watching, but uh, I'll get there. Um, the, um, thing, uh, the key question is, Bill, I've got a request. If you could, um, speak up a little bit. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we tend to mumble. Apologies. Um, the, the key thing is, um, um, uh, provenance is establishing the provenance. So if you will, the first link in the chain of custody, where did you get, where did you find the material? Uh, who found it, uh, what date. So it's, it's, it's not the chain of custody as a whole that's so important. It's important, but it sh it's important shouldn't be overstated. The key is the provenance. And uh, Rachel actually takes me to, her question takes me to an important point. We need to record the provenance, of course. Uh, again, that's technically very straightforward. Um, but the key thing at the point of acquisition is to take everything, yeah? So our, the CTA SOP from day one, uh, when we put the SOPs in place, when the money to start collecting material was still on the way in 2000, late 2012, so we put the SOPs in place, there, there was to be and has never been any triage in the field. Um, and there's, there's two reasons for that. Um, first, uh, our men and women in the field aren't trained anyhow to, 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 to do triage in that way. Um, but the second uh, uh, reason is, 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 is a legal and a, frankly a, a fairness reason um, is that um, aside from the fact that we don't know what we're gonna need at, at the point of collection, from a prosecutorial point of view, but it's you, you want to, in, in respect for the process, you want to ensure that you have uh, everything that's inculpatory, but also everything that's potentially exculpatory uh, or exculpatory with respect to whoever ultimately may be accused in whole or in part on the basis of that material. Um, so again, provenance and taking everything or taking nothing. And, and I'll just add that um, the, the most dangerous work, uh, and Mike, you've already alluded to it, for us in Syria um, has always been the movement of the paper, particularly in the early days, because there were so many armed groups running around and the confrontation lines were so fluid and there were so many elements that were hostile to our work, not just the Syrian regime, not just Daesh, um, other groups that um, that uh, the, the volumes of paper we're talking about. Remember, I said cumulatively now it must be about five tons. It that doesn't. It either takes a lot of space, or if it's being man packed uh, in some way, uh, it's heavy. And uh, so um, you only want to extract. It's the risk reward ratio. You only want to extract stuff that you think might be contribute to the building of the puzzle 
or one of the puzzles down the road. So, so obviously we would ignore driver's registration bureau or something that's never going to be relevant. But in the Syrian context, we've never taken police records. And because the Syrian police, regular police, I'm not talking about security intelligence, uh, quasi police, they are not, they have never been very much integrated into the apparatus of repression. Syrian uh, uh, police generally do regular police stuff there, deal with regular crime, uh, traffic issues, and, and, and like, like police elsewhere. And so the risk reward ratio of moving, you know, 100, 200 kilos of uh, or more police records from a particular facility, the likelihood being that that stuff would not be of much use. It's not worth it, it wasn't taken, it wouldn't be worth taking the risk. So hence we end up with the political, military, and security intelligence stuff, which is invariably uh, uh, useful. So I've got a few questions that are in the access, you know, somewhere between access to records and, and lessons learned, best practices. Uh, from uh, Iva, um, a reference to uh, history in the ICTY. Um, uh, Iva says the ICTY opened up much of its trial records for research, the only international court to do so. Would CJ ever open up part of its archives for research, the ones it can down the line? After all, Syrian researchers, but also others, should arguably have access to the archives about their own life experiences. And then I, th I think probably yeah. that and then uh, move on to the next two, which are about kind of, you know, best practices or lessons that you've identified uh, after nearly a decade of, of CJO. First, I have this question, and then we can okay. move on. Uh, I have uh, uh, Eva, I apologize if I pronounced it wrong. Well, I'm sure that I have because I said it too well. I do apologize. But uh, yeah, that's a great question. I uh, obviously have worked with the ICTY, and um, of course, many years ago now, I'm aware of. Um, the, the tribunal ultimately has made, I don't believe all of its records, but a great many uh, public now. Um, in fact, one of my um, other uh, colleagues here, who's our head of um, um, external relations, amongst other things, uh, was a longtime um, spokeswoman for the tribunal and head of outreach and very much involved in, in the process, which, which you're referencing at, at the ICT. Um, we're aware, um, I'm aware, um, with my background as, as a historian or at least studying history, um, that um, we are sitting on a very important repository of material for other than purely criminal justice purposes. And um, ideally, it, it would be available as soon as possible. Um, to researchers um, uh, and indeed to, to groups looking for the missing and, and, and so forth. There's a lot of, uh, particularly in the security intelligence material, a lot of uh, information, paperwork concerning uh, obviously individual prisoners. And in some cases, they're often fake. Um, and, and that's not being tapped. CJ has a very narrow criminal investigative and case building uh, mission. Um, We've been having discussions about the ultimate access to question for a while, but it's, it's not a decision for me or, or CJ to take um, on its own. But ultimately, what I certainly, I can only speak personally here, but um, what I'd like to see before too long, and let's say in the next year or two, is um, some sort of access. Uh, Through another institution, not, not through CG, because we're not set up to deal with research and so forth. And our location is secret and there's other issues, but, uh, um, but some sort of um, access to, to, to scholars and other interested persons um, along the lines of, of um, the access policies that were put in place in Central and Eastern Europe when you know former security intelligence archives and so forth were um, fell into democratic hands. Um, but ultimately, um, it's going to be up to um, um, others, 
working with CD to do that because we don't have that kind of expertise. And frankly, dare I say, we don't have the moral authority to, to determine unilaterally how, how that should work. We know our ethical responsibilities as, 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 as the owners, custodians, I don't know the correct term, of the material. Um, um, and we believe our responsibility is ultimately to make it available. Um, um, but all to, all, at the same time, we have a very strong ethical responsibility to protect uh, um, the names in, uh, in that material. And I refer to obviously the names of victims, um, but all, all, also the names of perpetrators um, the, the, or, or during regime officials who are not perpetrators. There's several million names in the collection. Um, and um, uh, um, the, 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 what we don't want is the, the collection to become, if you will, a mine or, or a, a scene that people mine um, to um, um, take revenge on, 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 on others. Um, because we saw that in Iraq when, when I was in the tribunal there. And, and some documents were put up in an early withdrawal session, and they uh, they had a from well, there was a paramilitary force called Oil Protection Forces that was used to suppress the '91 uprising, and uh, in, in Iraq, and, and uh, there were just some documents there, and there was a couple of uh, officers named in the document, Major Lieutenant Colonel. They, they weren't targets or suspects or on trial. And within a week, both those guys were dead. So that's the kind of thing we, uh, we, we obviously need to avoid. We've got a quest, uh, one question from SM Dean on, it's um, a broad question. After nearly a decade of CJO, what essentially, what essential lessons would you want to share? Similar question from Rana Ibrahim. What are CJO's best practices to train personnel? <laughs> Bearing records, especially in the event of language and cultural barriers, actually quite, quite different. One is quite broad, one specific to how you operate, but you know, sort of lessons observed, lessons learned, uh, best practices from from CJA. Uh, yeah, maybe three bullet points, and then then we can sort of scroll through the rest of the questions. Yeah, okay, so uh, yeah, lessons learned. Um, I mean, look, we have a lessons learned culture. We're always we're always trying to be better. Um, it's part of the institutional ethos. Um, I've been in in this work for quite a long time now. It's near 25 years. Uh, it's, it's 24 years next month. So um, the the um, um, I can't say that from a personal perspective, uh, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of new stuff. Um, the principal lessons I've learned are really related to doing this privately. Um, it's much easier to do it privately than in the public sector because of the freedom of movement and so forth. I speak from an operational perspective. But the, uh, um, doing it privately is, uh, on the flip side, it's the, the challenges in, in raising money, uh, keeping the attention of, of, of donors, of public officials in, in, in the West on uh, whatever situation you're dealing with. You'd be surprised how institutionally or politically, really it's coming at the, from the political level, um, interests change very rapidly. Uh, well, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but, uh, um, um, but uh, yeah, not, not much more than that. And the other question though, I'm just uh, flipping back to fish here. Um, that was from Rana. Yeah. Best practices yeah. and training personnel. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, look, CJA uh, isn't a training institution, but uh, um, but we've spent millions and millions training um, our personnel in Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere. Um, initially, it's not a lot of training. The key there's training at the beginning. The key is really mentoring. Uh, it's learning on the job through mentoring, and. Um, um, so uh, the, uh, we don't use our investigators to verify records. That's, that's at the analytical level. 
Um, there, there's not, we don't have problems with forgeries because we collect in bulk. We're not buying stuff like journalists off the back street in Istanbul or, or uh, Ghazi and Kef or, or something like that. Uh, Rahanli, some of the places on the border there. Um, we're collecting in bulk and, and we have so much stuff and the analysts have been with us for quite a few years. It, they would pick up immediately if something was, was a forgery. Um, all, all our analysts, um, except for the senior most analysts are, are Arabs. Um, some are Westerners who, who mastered Arabic. Others are, are from the region. Others um, are Westerners, but their, their parents were Arabic and they, they learned this uh, growing up. Um, we can't, um, in, in Asia, we, we have a different uh, language profile required. But basically, um, we won't hire analysts. Um, well, we hire people off the street with language skills and good education, and we turn them into analysts. Uh, that we find that the model works uh, quite well. It takes us about a year. Same with the investigators. It, it takes about a year before an analyst or a new investigator is is really getting the top things and working uh, working well, particularly on their own. Um, on their own within the team, if that makes sense. But um, uh, but basically, it's all mentoring. All mentoring. You're on mute. Um, yep. Thanks. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, I, I think I'll let you read it for yourself and decide whether you want to address it. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, CJ doesn't investigate uh, uh, any of the groups operating in northern Syria other than um, Syrian regime and what's left of Daesh. But um, look, there, there, there's um, it, it, it's a very complex armed conflict, and I haven't I've yet to see an armed conflict where um, even the most you know, young men with weapons and even the most uh, professional, um, well-disciplined forces, um, men will commit crimes. And uh, the question is how um, their commanders and, and their co countries uh, respond to the perpetration of those offenses. Um, I can't speak to the, the criminality, such as it may be, of, of the Turkish uh, proxy groups. I, I know there's a Broadly aware, I guess, better way to put it, that there's public criticism of, of their operations, not just in Syria, some of them deployed in Libya. Um, but in, in, in principle, um, and indeed in practice, any armed group, whether it's a proxy, a non state actor, a state actor, they, 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 the law is very clear. They need to conform to, to the law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law. So, um, if there if there's crimes, um, they can be investigated and punished uh, or prosecuted. As a practical matter, uh, I think with the Tur Turkish pro proxies, it, it, it may be quite difficult because uh, it would presumably have to fall as, again as a practical matter of the Turkish government to deal with that. But um, but in principle, there's no stop. Got a question from G. Leslie. Um, a few different questions bound up in there, but I think the most of it is focused on um, you know your your risk management, particularly in the field. And I guess this is a, a question that will the the answer will interest academic researchers who have to deal with you know some quite quite severe sort of ethical constraints on where and under what conditions they're allowed to do research. Um, you've alluded to some of this already in, in terms of, you know, being a, a private organization and, and you're, you're operating in a high risk environment in a way that maybe is not possible for somebody working for a public organization or other types of organizations. But I, G. Leslie's question here is what are, what are the red lines over organizations you'll work with? You've alluded to that. Uh, safety of working with them, ethical considerations, the, the whole sort of gamut. Yeah, I mean, um, the only place we've had people uh, lost or hurt, um, uh, not knock on knock on wood, on my crappy IKEA fake wood desk, um, is uh, is Syria. We've been very uh, fortunate elsewhere. Um, I like to think uh, um, across the board we've been fortunate because we take uh, security extremely uh, seriously. 
um, there's a lot of security protocols in place and, and uh, there's general protocols and then there's um, security arrangements built around particular missions. A classic example would be uh, extraction of material um, across or around confrontation lines. This obviously has to go case by case. Um, and ultimately, I, I, I've alluded to this in the, already when I spoke about, say, are not taking uh, Syrian police records. Ultimately, you're looking at the risk reward um, ratio and balancing that against, um, uh, ultimately, as, as the person in charge, my responsibility um, as the head of CG for first and foremost, the, the security and safety of our, our personnel. So, uh, and the final thing I'll point I'll make there is um, we learned, I think, to go back to the question about lesson learned, lessons learned, one of the lessons I learned the hard way at the beginning, and I should have known better because I spent uh, two and a half years in Iraq during the insurgency before we started the siege, um, is do not leave it to the local staff to uh, do what's best for, uh, from a security point of view. Um, there's considerable cultural differences if we take Syria as an example between um, uh, my approach to security planning, that of my colleagues who at the senior level, who are operational level, who are all Westerners with military and security backgrounds. There's a big difference between our approach and the approach of, of, of Syrians. And Syrians are the ones at risk, uh, physical risk, of course. Um, the, the Syrian ethos, as uh, we again discovered the hard way, is more, uh, right, we have to go to A to B, and, and the security planning seem to be limited to um, do we need a two door vehicle or a four door vehicle? And then, hey, let's go. and hope for the best and, and God will you know, keep an eye on us if, if, we, if we're good men and, and this kind of stuff. So that, that didn't work. And, and um, so there's a lot more uh, from that point in 2012, a lot more control and that sort of thing from the headquarters. That was a lesson learned. No one got killed. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the fellows was shot uh, on the first uh, document extraction mission. Uh, he wasn't too badly hurt in the end, but he did get shot. So, <clears throat> um, and, um, I think that's, um, yeah, basically that's it. Risk reward against ethical responsibilities. Yep. Um, from Mafalda uh, um, about uh, linking perpetrator to crime, attributing responsibility. Um, I, th I think you walked us through some of that in terms of different kinds of witnesses and what, what you know, each kind of testimony can provide and see you painting context, particularly in the, in the, um, in the, uh, uh, wrestling case that we, that we saw in the headlines today. Um, but do you want to say, you know, a word or two on that? I, I, thank you, Mafalda. I, I, I would just add, um, um, I, I would just add that certainly where our operations vis-a-vis -vis Dash and, other Islamic State and, and the Syrian regime are concerned. There's no, um, uh, there's very few perpetrators or suspected perpetrators who held any rank who will not show up in our systems. And, and what I mean is we don't have, we wouldn't have any primary evidence, documentation, or electronic, in paper electronic form that. Um, that didn't have their name. We, we just have that much stuff. So um, now, as you get further down the chain of command, um, particularly where Dash is concerned, and, and their use of um, Acuna, the, the, the nom de guerre, um, it, it does become more complicated. But uh, for serious targets, for ranking targets, and, and almost mid ranking and above, um, if, if we don't have some primary evidence, it's, it doesn't take us any time. To to uh, um, um, generate some, some information, some leads. Got a question from Victor. Um, hang on, it just jumped up. Um, 
So in the case, uh, I think there's an assumption that, you know, when, when law enforcement and prosecutors working in institutional silos, is that creating gaps? Are, are things falling through the cracks and missing, missing you know, are, are they not getting the attention they deserve because of those kind of, um, I guess, I guess, yeah, institutional silos? I think that's the nature of the question. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know what you do for a living, uh, Victor, but that's, uh, we say at home, that's very much an inside baseball question. Um, it's, it's, uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, where war crimes are concerned, the, the, the uh, national war crimes units and, and uh, international bodies are in the main uh, nowadays for the last few years quite well joined up through um, uh, some informal uh, structures. So there's the normal um, uh, mutual legal assistance uh, structures between states, and states and international institutions, UN bodies and so forth. Um, but there's some quite good uh, informal structures, particularly something called the Genocide Network, uh, which is part of um, uh, Europol. And it brings together, it's a secretariat that brings together twice a year for formal meetings, um, all the national war crimes units in uh, European Union member states, police and prosecutors, plus um, Norway, Switzerland, now the UK, Canada, United States are all ex official members. So that, that forum, is informal, but it works extremely well as, a, as an informal information uh, exchange uh, mechanism. The bigger problem is uh, on the law enforcement side is where um, when you get into more of the terrorism space, um, generally war crimes and um, uh, terrorism offenses are investigated by different elements, even within the same states. It, it, it's almost invariably the case. Um, that is slowly uh, started to improve over the last couple of years. Um, and it's, it, that, that improvement is gathering momentum. So that helps within a given state. But then the interstate cooperation on terrorism issues, if it's from a public security perspective, it it works uh, pretty well, um, but when it's from a law enforcement that is case building perspective, it is quite siloed there because there isn't a central uh, uh, clearinghouse, if you will, to, to coordinate um, the investigation of terrorism offenses as a law, well, as a law enforcement problem. Um, UNITAD, the UN body set up. So where Dash is concerned, you have UNITAD, the UN body uh, set up in Iraq to um, 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 act as a clearinghouse, uh, complementary to some other clearinghouses set up by the coalition, for example, and an Interpol um, for information and prima facie evidence concerning Dash criminality. Um, it hasn't, uh, at least as yet, reached its potential. It's been up and running for, um, I think, about two and a half years now. Now it's a UN body, so two and a half years and uh, sort of critical. By, by, by UN standards, that's relatively recent. <laughs> um, um, but I think um, surely UNITAD will, will, will develop in the way it's envisioned. And, uh, um, but you do point to an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, and, and is being, but so much smaller, I think, than, than many of us would like. Sort of, um, there's, there's a question that follows nicely from that, I think, on, on from Brad Robinson. Um, how has CJA managed donors' expectations and limitations when, uh, when, when you're partnered, when you're, you know, the, the, when you're, we're talking about the kind of relationships that you have to have or that you need to have on the ground, uh, dealing with armed groups in pursuance of your work? Yeah, just with, uh, uh, I know it's a cliche, but transparency. Um, when CJ had very little money, um, initially we had for the first uh, couple of years, we, say the first year and a half, um, we only had a bit of UK money that enabled us to develop our collection capability in, in uh, Syria 
the, the, the initial uh, collection capability. And then, um, but we had no analytical, we had no administrative component. Um, my company was, some of us were working pro bono, my company was putting a bit of money in and that kind of thing for, to keep everything together. Um, but it was that, and, but the real heroes there were the UK FCO or FCDO now um, that, you know, keeping us going. And, and, but when I was running around for, really took a, a quite a long time um, trying to raise money from donor states or potential donor states in the EU um, to build what became CJ, a super nuts criminal investigative body. Um, after the after the first question would be, um, you know, isn't the UN doing this already? Because they didn't understand the difference between criminal investigations and human rights inquiries. Because typically, the people with the money, um, of course, have not worked in our field, have not studied law, and so forth. There's the odd exception, but they're very rare. So the um, uh, second question would be, how are you going to get the, the, the evidence? And uh, so before we had any money. I started to explain that we would need to build partnerships in the field. And uh, um, so that's always been an understood part of the CJ modus operandi. Um, and the donors coming in need to understand that um, the potential reputational risk to uh, them um, of, of our operating that way. So it's, it's uh, and they always have done, actually. We've never had a problem with uh, um, losing money or, or at least as presented to us, not getting money um, because of, of these sorts of partnerships and, and our investigative modus operandi more generally. I've always used the metaphor that um, in, in meetings, particularly fundraising meetings, that Criminal investigations, domestic and international, both. It's the same in the public sector as it is with CJA. Um, that it's it's like sausage making. It, it, you know, you might love sausage, but there's a lot of people who don't want to know what how it's made, and what goes into it. So. I think there's a. Um, I'm just skipping forward one question. Uh, you've been talking about finances, and there's another question from Juliet One Down. Uh, I don't know if you want to take a look at that and 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 address that as part of that discussion about the challenges, I guess, in terms of fundraising and, and managing things and you know sausage making. Yeah, we we were accused by uh, an EU body of uh, actually not fin well financial all this financial wrongdoing of fraud, and uh, that that allegation was false. It, uh, revolved around a letter of support that was provided uh, to us, um, actually to a partner group, not to CJA per se, um, to secure an EU grant. So the EU, FCO said the, um, gave us the letter, we gave it to the EU, and then some years later, another part of the EU came and said that that letter had been forged. And uh, so ultimately we simply had the FCO tell that Avoid profanity here. Telling uh, telling that e body that uh, no, we we wrote the letter and uh, and that was basically the end of it. Okay, let's move on. Um, just a couple of questions left. I think there's one at the bottom from Victor, which is a, a repeat of a previous question. Uh, a couple of um, uh, look like um, notes of thanks and uh, for the insights. Uh, two, three substantive questions left. From Louis, uh, what's the extent of CJ's cooperation with neighbors of Iraq and Syria in terms of moving evidence out of the countries, out of, out of these countries? So an operational kind of, kind of question, how CJ works in the field. Um, yeah, I have to take the fifth on that one, Mike. Uh, yeah. I do, I do apologize to, to the, the, the question of that. Yeah, no, so, some things are, are, are can, can't really be discussed. Um, uh, a pretty straightforward forward question from Nura. What kind of time frame did the documents, uh, CJ documents, uh, cover? What's, what's the sort of time frame? Is there anything from pre-2000? Two-part question. Yeah, if we're talking about uh, DASH, 
the documents uh, date from the creation of Dash, so uh, late 2013, beginning of 2014, to I wouldn't say the present day, but quite close to it, um, still bringing stuff in. With the Syrian regime, um, th there's the majority of the materials date from um, uh, 2011, the start of the conflict, so um, uh, later 2015, basically the point at which the regime uh, counteroffensive commenced with, with the Russian uh, air support. Um, there is pre-2011 materials, uh, regime materials, um, not immense amounts as far as I know, but it does, uh, well, there's a fair bit, but um, we tend not to work with that because our, our temporal focus is on, on the events since 2011. I'm losing your audio a little bit, Bill. <laughs> losing my voice. <laughs> That's the problem. So I'll, I'll uh, hold the water. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got a question, another question from Mafalda. Um, I'll, I'll just read the question out. In, in terms of evidence, if CJ finds proof that a certain act was carried under carried out under the effective control of a state and can be attributable to that state, does CJ deliver the evidence more closely with the You've written ICJ, I think you mean ICC, Mafalda, but that's the question in that matter. Do you want to, I, I think this has been touched on sort of in different ways, but do you want to yeah. go? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. We work with um, uh, 12, 13, 13 uh, states, law enforcement bodies, myriad law enforcement prosecutorial bodies in 13 Western states plus, uh, plus Australia, <clears throat> down at the bottom of the world there. And uh, international bodies such as the ICC and, and, and the like with a criminal investigative mandate. Um, the, um, we received, we've received over the last four years about 500 and uh, just about 600 requests, formal requests for assistance from our partners um, involving about 2,000 suspects, Daesh and, and uh, Syrian regime. And these are suspects that are uh, known to be present in Western states, in our partner states. Um, some of the requests concern quite involved analytical support, for example, in, in support of the uh, lunch trial. And um, so, yeah, there's just a constant back and forth with our uh, operational partners, as we call them. Uh, um, their needs are uh, presented to us and, and we respond to those needs. And we also have a tracking team uh, tracking uh, higher level suspects. And in the last, based on information we received from our personnel in the field, um, there's quite a bit of uh, add-ons to, to the core function. That's it for our questions, which is good because I think you're running out of voice uh, and yeah. it's getting a little bit later. So, so thanks. I guess I want to I want to close with one question for you, um, uh, and it, it's it's about that eco it's that ecosystem question I, I alluded to. I think when we were you know before before we met this evening, um, you know there are different sorts of organizations that have emerged over the last few years. Um, you know, 10 years ago, everybody, WikiLeaks was the, was the, was the name on, on the tips of everyone's tongues. But since then, you know, others have come out and become quite prominent. Bellingcat is, is, is quite prominent now for, for, you know, kinds of research it does and the way it does its work. Forensic architecture is another one that does some interesting work. Um, and I, I guess it's, uh, uh, my question is, can you comment on that ecosystem? What do you think of that ecosystem now? Uh, especially, especially you know, knowing what you know now, um, and and what that ecosystem looks like now, if you had to do this over again, starting right at the beginning, you know, at the beginning of CJ, would you do anything differently? I'm running uh, out of voice as well. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not sure I would do CJ again. It's been the best job that I've ever had, um, but it is it, at times it's been taxing uh, the, the fundraising component, even though we've always had enough money. Um, with the generosity of our donors, but it is a scramble at times. The, um, e the, let's call it the operational ecosystem. Uh, you can't imagine the change over the last five years. Um, the five, well, I guess he started in 2011, but, but you know, we only received substantial funding from mid 2013. 
and have been going that way. So that's quite recent. CG, I suppose, was the first big boy out of the starting blocks and, and still are, I guess, a big kid. But there's, there's Bellingcat, there's the Berkeley Human Rights Law Center, there's uh, FADH, F-I-D-H, a French NGO, which is principally human rights, but it always mucked in, even in my day at the ICT, in, in helping with the establishment of crime base, uh, using their resources on the ground with the conflict zones, particularly with the ICC, as I said. And so, uh, so from a building an institution like CJA that is sort of soup to nuts, collection to case building, um, that's really tough. It's, it's the moon and the stars were in a certain alignment uh, for me personally, professionally. Um, we had the right conflict in a certain way. Um, there was a lot of luck, but there's room for more seed. There's a more application of the soup to nuts uh, model. And this is certainly something that we're try, trying to uh, uh, encourage as an institution um, because seed is frankly big enough already. We, we, we don't want to be bigger, just take on more and more and more conflicts. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not, it wouldn't be ideal, it's, it's better to spread it around the responsibility. Um, and then you have the niche outfits such as Bellingcat or Ber Berkeley Human Rights Law Center, which are extremely skilled uh, they, in, in different ways in, in exploiting um, uh, open sources, exploiting the internet. And I'm a huge fan of, of, of both those, and, and there's some other smaller ones as well. And um, again, they're um, um, very focused and have, have educated themselves by engaging proactively with the public sector in how to do their jobs such that their collection will, will feed uh, criminal investigations and ultimately successful prosecutions. Um, so there's been an increasingly as a cultural change on, on the nonprofit or, or, or the private sector, the civil societal, NGO side, whatever you want to call it. Um, you always had some niches like International Commission for Missing Persons, which has been going since the mid-90s, since 96. It did the vast majority of exhumations uh, after the Bosnian War. And so again, very niche, highly technical, but exhumations for transitional justice purposes, but in a way to feed the criminal uh, investigative and prosecutorial process, particularly at the ICTY and the state court, uh, hybrid court in Sarajevo. So, um, so, but it's growing and growing and growing. And, and I think one of the reasons it's growing, um, I suspect at least is people see CJ and the intention uh, that, that CJ is afforded and think that, hey, this appears to be something worth doing. And, and uh, you know, the human rights space, you know, generally speaking, internationally, you could say, you know, it's pretty well covered by some of the big boys and, and some of the mid-sized groups and, and indeed some of the niche smaller groups um, focusing on business and human rights and this sort of thing. Um, but uh, so, hey, Let's, let's try this criminal law stuff. And, and, and the flip side of that is, first of all, the domestic police and, and secondarily the prosecutors were incredibly quick, despite the preconception that, that policing is very conservative and, and law is a very conservative profession. They were, have been very quick uh, where they're looking at interna core international crimes to embrace private sector support. Um, and, 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 and to nurture that to the extent, not through training, but through some informal mentoring and, and uh, back and forth in terms of uh, rules of procedure and evidence and so forth. What's been slower to embrace that, but is starting to improve, uh, has started to improve markedly over the last couple of years are the international bodies. Um, but again, there's been a sea change in this respect that the ICC uh, in the last two, three years. Um, and uh, there, there wasn't resistance or animosity. It just, they were just thinking in a sort of a self-contained way. So <clears throat> the idea of CJA that informed the idea is to have 
overall more justice uh, faster at a much reduced cost. Almost an economic argument. And, uh, and the key to that, because of the flexibility of the private sector operators, if, if they're working to a criminal uh, evidentiary standard, um, um, is the, the key is you get, you get more justice faster in a fraction of the cost. Um, so it's not, and, and that's where the ecosystem, which is uh, to sum up, is developing very quickly. And, um, and this is the biggest development in, in, in our field of law, international criminal law since, in my opinion, since the, uh, the first two ad hoc tribunals were set up in the mid nineties. That's good, thank you. That's a good point to end on. <clears throat> I think um, my, what I'll, the point I'll close on is, um, is that CJA is, is part of a, you know, a longer historical trend, tradition, call it what you will, of documenting conflict before, during, and after by all sorts of different parties. I mean, you know, war zones are competitive research environments. All different kinds of entities are running around trying to find out things um, and, and trying to find out, you know, what, what, uh, how these things work, what, what kinds of things they have in common, uh, what we can learn from all of that. That's, that's what the Conflict Records Unit is about. Uh, for anybody who's interested in some of the, the depth of uh, history that's associated with this. We've got a we've got a pretty detailed bibliography on the on the unit's website. Uh, it might be a bit late to uh, drop in the um, the uh, the the uh, the link for that, but uh, it's in the initial registration page, anyways. The links are all there, so do do go to the uh, conflict records unit page at, at the Sir Michael Howard Center uh, for the history of war at King's College uh, to find out more and drop us a line as well. Bill, thank you. This was excellent. Uh, probably longer than than we expected. I ran out of water a little while ago, uh, so I've been I've been sipping on the dregs of my coffee. Um, but I think it's about time to give voices a rest. Uh, Joe, do you want to finish off? Really, to thank you both for a superb and compelling talk, and uh, 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 you know we we had a great audience and fantastic questions. So thank you, thank you, uh, thank you all, and and good evening, and look look forward to the next in the series of the talks. Indeed. Thank you. Bill, thank you. Just us now or? Uh...